living in the tombs because they couldn't keep him contained. I don't know why they bound him. You can sort of imagine a number of reasons. You could imagine it was because they were afraid of him. You can imagine it was because they hated him and the way that he reminded them that so much is outside of our power and our control. It might have been the people who loved him who did it to try to protect him from himself, not knowing what else they could do, powerless in the face of his suffering. But none of it worked. Did he have a name? We don't find out. If he had a name, did he even know it anymore? Did the people around him even remember it? Or had he become the things that made him suffer? Was he just identified by the things about him that made people afraid? He lives in the tombs. He's raving. He's a danger to himself and others. We all have known how we can get labeled by things, and our name seems not even to matter. Legion, that word legion, is a reminder of the Roman armies that have moved in and set up camp. He is being attacked on all fronts. Thousands upon thousands in a legion. Our culture, we don't have the same language for the demonic that Jesus' culture did. Our community understands things differently, but boy, howdy, we recognize what's going on here, don't we? We know what unending suffering can be. We know that there are layers upon layers of forces that do not care what our names are, that want to tell us who we are and what we are. Legion. This reminder of the Roman armies that have marched into this world and the lives of these people and defined everything by their power and their violence. We know about powers that march in and occupy our lives. We know about suffering, about physical suffering that just doesn't let up, or spiritual suffering psychological suffering for which it feels like there is no relief that want to take us over and make it so that we cannot see past the end of our own noses. We know about oppression. We know about relationships and memories that seem to get such a hold on us that we are constantly in pain. We know about social structures that want to dominate and lock up and pretend like Every single human is not unique, does not have a name, is not created in the image of God. We know about those powers. We know about the powers of our own sinfulness, those patterns that we just cannot break no matter how hard we try. We know about the selfishness that turns us in on ourselves and buys into all the lies the world tells us. We know about evil. We know about the power in this world, the violence and the death that seem to be lurking behind every page of the newspaper, wars and famines and violence, hopelessness that send precious children of God to live in the tombs. We know those evils that make the walking dead out of those into whom God breathes life under an overpass, in a refugee camp, In the garbage dumps of the developing world, children separated from parents and penned in without adequate care, profit, and power that make tombs out of whole communities, poisoning the air or the water, housing the poor on soil that's so full of lead it's not safe for children to go barefoot. Living in tombs happens right in our backyard just as much as it does anywhere else in the world. Evil is real. We may not be expecting to find it lurking around every corner with horns and a tail, but we know that the forces that defy God are legion. They batter us. They batter our world until we forget our own names, 
until we give in and we stop calling others by their names and just label them by their affliction or their difference. Possession is everything that conspires to keep us dead when God wants us alive. And in walks Jesus. In walks Jesus in a place he does not belong. He's crossed the lake, gone inland, to a community that's full of Gentiles. He has no other business there. There is no place that he is going. It's not on the way. Jesus walks into this Gentile community like he owns the place. He does. And the first words out of his mouth, What is your name? What is your name? Even as this man is so bound that he can't answer for himself, Jesus knows. Jesus knows he has a name. Jesus knows he has a name that his father and mother gave him when he was so tiny and so fresh and they were all filled with such hope. Jesus knows he has a name that says he is someone, that he is part of a family, that he is part of a community. But even before any of that, Jesus knew this man was a precious creation of God, holy, because he was made in the image of his creator. And so Jesus asks, what is your name? And maybe you know how it feels when someone wants to know your name. Not in that I'm filling out a form name, not that voice, but the one that makes a connection. It says, what is your name? I'd like to know you. I see you. You seem worth knowing. What is your name? That's the first invitation, friends, in our gospel this morning. It's the invitation to hear Jesus in the middle of whatever tomb you might find yourself living in, to hear Jesus, who has come to this far side of the lake, the Gentile side of the lake, this place where he has no real business, just to find you. To hear Jesus ask, through all of the voices that want to tell us who we are, to hear Jesus ask, what is your name? Because Jesus sees you, the real you. Jesus has come wading through all of these things that take up occupation in your world, in your mind, in your heart, in order that Jesus might know you. To make that connection we cannot make on our own. What is your name? Now, the second invitation is to follow our friend and to find ourselves at the feet of Jesus. It might be for you on this particular morning a deliberate move to find yourself at the feet of Jesus, to step away from a place that's comfortable and safe and settled. On the ground at someone's feet is not where we'd like to think of ourselves. It's not very dignified. Or maybe you are like me, and you trip often enough that you find yourself down in that posture all the blooming time. And there are the feet of Jesus. Or we might even be like our friend who seems to be at the feet of Jesus, not because he is able to make any of those moves on his own, but simply because those that own him are terrified, and they know power when they see it. And they are flinging themselves at the feet of Jesus, begging for mercy. However we get there, when we are at the feet of Jesus, we're where we need to be, because that's where we find freedom. That's where we recognize our complete dependence on the God whose love is stronger than death. Jesus knows your name. Jesus knows my name. And he doesn't just 
know that. He knows the names of all of the powers occupying this world. And Jesus speaks with the voice of God, the voice that created out of nothing and separated light from darkness. Everything has to answer to that voice. Jesus' voice is power, and Jesus' voice is freedom, and Jesus' voice is clarity that separates us from all of those things that want to occupy us. Jesus' voice is the word of God's love for us hanging on a cross. Jesus' voice spoke the last word on sin and death and the devil. It is finished. Hanging on a cross, Jesus spoke the last word on you and on me. Father, forgive. So we fall at the feet of the one who speaks with such power, the power to free us. But it's not just that, right? He knows our name and he gives it back to us. In baptism, we are claimed by name, right? John, child of God, I baptize you, right? We are claimed by name. And then we are declared to be a child of God beyond any power or label that the world might give. We don't too often baptize people naked anymore. Sometimes a little tiny baby, we will. Put them right in the font and get them good and wet. Most of the time, we just remember that that was the tradition, that we brought nothing to Jesus. We fall naked at Jesus' feet, bringing nothing, and he lifts us up and clothes us, right? We heard what Paul said. In Christ Jesus, you are all children of faith. As many of you as were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. There is no longer Jew or Greek. There is no longer slave or free. There is no longer male and female. All of you are one in Christ Jesus. You belong to Christ. We are invited to find ourselves now with our friend, whose name apparently only Jesus is going to know, seated at Jesus' feet, clothed and in our right mind. Thanks be to God. Now that would be a nice place to stop, but there are more invitations in our story. The next one is the invitation Jesus gave to our friend as he was leaving, as he wanted to go with Jesus, and Jesus said, nope, stay here. Stay free and tell what God has done. Stay there where those powers that owned him, where the names that he was called, they're all still floating around, and Jesus said, stay there. Stay free and tell what God has done not easy. It's not just putting a nice bumper sticker on our car. It's not underlining our personal moral victories so everybody can see what holiness looks like. Staying and telling about the one whose name we bear means that we are commissioned to resist those powers that want to take away everybody else's name. Following Jesus and telling about what God has done and what God does again and again and again means that we have to remember God only gives us a few names for people who are different from us. And those names are created in the image of God. Neighbor. This is one from the the epistles. One for whom Christ died. And child of God. Those are are the names that we are given to go and give to our neighbors, to remind them and the world that that is who they are. And so I wonder if you would do the experiment this week, as I did a little bit clicking through last night, um, and in the newspaper or on social media, replace those names that we use that are not someone's given name, those labels that we have and replace those with one of these names that God has given. Thousands of children of God seeking refuge at the border. 
Ooh. Authorizing that strike would kill 150 neighbors. Hundreds for whom Christ died are addicted in our community to prescription painkillers. Children of God still have no clean drinking water. To stay and to tell, it's a big challenge, but it's a joy and it's a gift. And the other question that scripture leaves us with is how are we going to handle it when Jesus marches into our world and acts as if he owns the place? When we see how Jesus operates, when we see how it disregards our carefully constructed sense of order and it destroys our property even, that's terrifying. And so that last invitation for our story is the invitation to wonder, will we welcome the power of Jesus into our midst or will our fear ask him to leave?